Um, yeah, anyhow, if you've got a Bible tonight, go ahead and open to Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16. Tonight we're going to be continuing week two uh, of our four-week series uh, that's kind of taking us through the book of Proverbs in a, in a kind of scattered way, uh, but we're doing four weeks on the subject of wisdom, Proverbs being the book of wisdom in Scripture. Uh, and so uh, the series is called The Pursuit of Wisdom. And so last week, if you're with us, we talked about what is wisdom, or rather, who is wisdom uh, in Jesus Christ, the person of wisdom himself. Paul in 1 Corinthians 1 says that Jesus has become for us wisdom from God. And so we established kind of the broad stroke of theology and what is wisdom last week. And so this week, what we're going to do, I'm kind of excited about this, we're kind of going to, we're going to bring the theology we established last week, and we're going to drop it right on the ground to where all of us live and to where all of us have questions and all of us uh, are looking for answers. And what we're going to talk about tonight is this question that all of us have, uh, and it's that how, how do I understand what God wants for my life? How do I understand what to, how do I understand how to come around my life with a kind of wisdom shaped by God's word when it comes to decision making? The decisions that I make on a day-to-day -day basis, big life decisions and then everyday decisions, how do I have this shaped by the Word of God? And so to establish our time together, we're going to be looking at a verse here in Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 9. And so if you've got a Bible, uh, we're going to be sort of in this passage tonight. Uh, and then if you don't have a Bible, the words will be on the screen behind me. But I want to read this verse to establish what we're going to be doing for the next few minutes. Uh, and then we'll go from there. And so Proverbs 16, 9. The word of Christ speaks to us like this. The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Have you ever asked the question, what if? Like, have you ever thought to yourself, what if, what if I had gone to college somewhere different? What if, what if I were born somewhere different and I had different parents? What if, what if I had asked that girl on the date, gone forward, asked her on the date, instead of waiting so long for someone else to swoop in there, get her on the date, for them to have the relationship, and they just got married this past weekend. What if that, would I be getting married this past weekend? What if, right? What if? What if I had taken a different job? What if I lived in a different city? What would be different about my life if even the smallest details were different and I were given a different opportunity? What if? I think this is a question that's common to all of us. This is a question that is common to all of our thinking and all of our reflecting. This is the kind of question that surfaces for you and me when we're stuck in traffic on Mopac, right? This is the kind of question that floods our minds when we're there in the shower or we're laying our head on the pillow at night. This is, these are the times where we look back on our lives and we think about the things that have happened to us. And there's a way we can look back that actually brings forward gratitude and thankfulness as we, as we think about what if and we go, well, there's some things I don't, I don't want different. There are certain thoughts I have that cross my mind that I think, man, I'm so glad that I did. Right? So, so for example, I'm so glad that nearly 40 years ago, my grandfather, then a salesman, was passing through Enid, Oklahoma, and he had a hunger pain that caused him to stop at a particular restaurant and lock eyes with a cute little waitress. And there was something about that whole attraction that made him follow through and do something about that attraction, work his game, as it were. And that waitress would become my grandmother. And their decision to get married and to start a family brought about my mother and thus me. And I don't know where I would be today. I don't even know who I would be if that salesman and that waitress hadn't locked eyes in Enid, of, in Enid Oklahoma of all places. I'm so glad my grandfather went through with the whole thing. I'm so glad that when I was in eighth grade, I decided to go to a Wednesday night student ministry service when all my friends couldn't go I went alone for the first time, and it was on that night that I heard and I believed the gospel for the first time. And I'm so glad I did that. I'm so glad that a year ago this time, I accepted the offer to become the college director here at the Austin Stone, 
instead of taking another ministry position that was offered to me at the same time in Oklahoma. After a year of doing ministry here at this church, serving you and serving the broader body of our church, I can honestly say that this has been one of the deepest pleasures and privileges of my life. I absolutely love what I get to do, and I wouldn't, I can't think about doing anything else anywhere else. And so all of us know this. There, there's a way we can look back and, and have gratitude and thankfulness on decisions we've made, but it's also true we can look back on decisions we've made, and it's different. We can look back at other decisions, and, and there's frustration, there's confusion, there's sadness, and there's a wishing that things were different. Like for some of you, you're walking in the room tonight, and what brings you here is, is a search for clarity. Uh, you're, you're looking for clarity in a job situation. Uh, you're, you're looking for clarity tonight, maybe some of you in, in a relationship situation that you've gotten entangled in, and you're wondering, what's the best way forward? There's others of you that you're looking for clarity really in all of life because of some recent decisions that you've made, uh, or some recent things that you've gotten yourself caught up in, and you're now wondering, what do I do next? I wish things were different. There are some of you that come in tonight and you've made some decisions recently and you're beginning to wonder, have I, have I derailed myself from the plan that God has for me? Have I derailed myself from the plan that God had for my life? And you're wondering what you need to do about that. You see, we could sit in this room all day and all night thinking back on our lives, having either gratitude or resentment or fear. And we could play out all kinds of scenarios and we could play out all different situations and ask the question, what if? We could go on and on and desire alternate histories, but here's the reality. We don't have an alternate history. We only have the one we're living with. And even though we can ask what if a thousand times, we don't have what if, we only have what is. And so all of us feel the weight of the decisions that we make, don't we? All of us feel the pressure of, of, of the way decisions can have consequences in our lives. And so the question I want us to tackle tonight, the question I want us to look at, is how can we have our lives shaped by a wisdom from God, shaped by a wisdom that's pleasing to Him when it comes to the decisions we make? Notice back at Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 9. As I said earlier, this verse is going to become a framework for us tonight as we think through decision making. And there's two parts of the verse, and we're going to tackle the two parts as we travel back through the evening together. But let's read it again. Proverbs 16 verse 9, it says this, The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. And so the first part of that verse says this, the heart of man plans his way. And so all of us know this. All of us know exactly what this verse is talking about. This is, this is not new news. This is not new revelation. All of us know what it's like to plan our way. Every one of us have in our minds a picture or an idea of what we would like to do, where we would like to go, the direction we would like our life to be heading. All of us know what it's like to plan our way. But what I want us to think about tonight is what does it look like for us to plan our way in our hearts in a way that's in accordance to the person of wisdom, Jesus? What does it look like to develop a plan for our life that's according to Jesus himself, the person of wisdom? And so to kind of help us track through tonight what it looks like to, to make plans uh, that are according to wisdom, I have sort of four categories or four steps I want us to, to think through. And here they are. If you're taking notes, four steps to kind of making wise decisions in the way of wisdom. Number one, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? Number two, what do the people of God say? Number three, what do you want most— and number four, trust God. <laughs> now, I wanted all of my points to start with what and to sound alike. I just couldn't figure out how to make that fourth one do it, right? So that's, that's what we've got. We've got, what does the Bible say? What do the people of God say? What do you want most? And trust God. That's kind of where we're headed for the next few minutes together. And so let's tackle the first one. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? Now, here's the thing. We've got to start here, and even though it might sound elementary to some of you, this might sound like a given. We've got to go ahead and say this. We've got to put it out there because here's the temptation for all of us. Maybe if you're a Christian, the temptation is going to be, yeah, 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 I know what the Bible says, 
Then you move right on past it. Yeah, 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 the Bible here. But here's the thing. If we really believe that God is our final authority and he has finally spoken authoritatively to us in the scriptures, then we can't just yeah, 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 the Bible. We've actually got to deal with what it says. What is God saying to us in the scriptures when it comes to the decisions that we're making? And so when we approach the scriptures, the first question we've got to ask as we're thinking about a decision is this. Does the Bible have any ethical or moral objections to the decision I'm making? Does the Bible have any moral or ethical objections to the decision that I'm making? And so this one is easy, right? If the Bible clearly speaks that what we're thinking about doing and the decision we're trying to navigate is sinful, then the process stops right there. If God has said no to it, we also ought to say no to it. And and so, so this is, do I lie or not lie? Do I have sex outside of marriage or not? Do do I cheat on this business deal or in school or not? The Bible speaks very clearly to those things, and so the answer ought to be clear for us. If God in his word is saying no, then we also ought to say no, right? That's where the process stops if, if there's a moral or ethical objection to the decision we're making. But for most of us, we, we aren't dealing with those kinds of questions. We're dealing with questions um, that, that are a little bit more gray. The Bible doesn't clearly speak to these things. And so if what we're thinking through, the decision we're trying to make, isn't clearly addressed in Scripture, then we've got to move to two fundamental truths in the Word of God. We move to two fundamental truths, and here they are. We think about God's gospel, and we think about God's mission. These, these two truths are so glorious for us because they help us understand who God is, who we are, and how our purpose down here in life should play out. And so let's take the, let's take the gospel first. We think about God's gospel. I think if most of us were honest, there, there is this fear that sort of lives down inside of us that, that if, we, if we make a wrong decision, that somehow God's will for our life, God's plan for our life is going to be derailed. Like typically, I think for most of us, we, we probably wouldn't even say this out loud or know to say it, but I think there's some of us that think that God's plan for our life is like this. There's a point A and there's a point B, and his will and plan is a straight line. And if you ever deviate from it, that, then you're off. That's simply not true. And this is why the gospel is so critical to keep in mind when we're making decisions. Because here's what the gospel is going to tell us. That you and I aren't defined by the sum total of the decisions that we make. That's not how you and I are defined. Instead, you and I are defined by every right decision that Jesus has made. And because of what he's done, we are now secure in him. We are defined by Jesus in all of his decisions of righteousness and obedience on our behalf. And so as believers, we don't fear losing something. As believers, we don't fear being derailed from something with God. We don't fear that at all because Jesus has already secured us. Now as I say this, this doesn't mean just go on and live however you want. Make whatever decision you want because Jesus has secured you and he'll always take you back and forgive you. That's not what I'm saying. That kind of mentality is called presuming upon grace, playing games with God. And the scriptures warn violently against that kind of mentality. Galatians tells us God will not be mocked. That's the kind of mentality of unbelievers. And so here's what I am saying though. We don't fear losing something because as the children of God, We don't have to fear messing our lives up with a decision. We don't have to fear that up. In fact, here's what the gospel comes in to tell us. You've already messed your life up with a myriad of bad decisions, but Jesus has redeemed all of that, right? And so now you live toward God and you live with a freedom and a security knowing that you're secure in him and nothing can change that. That's God's gospel. So when you're making a decision, remove from the table your life being a wreck. Remove from the table. God's got a plan for you. God's got a path for you, and Christ has secured that. Does that make sense? The second thing we keep in mind is this, God's mission. God's mission. So the Bible's very clear. The Bible's very clear on this. Whatever you're deciding, whatever decision you've got in front of you, 
The one thing that is always true is that Jesus has called us to live a life of mission and advancing his name and his fame into every channel of our life. That's always clear. And so Charles Spurgeon, we use this quote often around here, but it just works. Charles Spurgeon said this, that every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. That's it. Every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. Part of what it means to be a Christian, a believer, a follower of Jesus, is that you're on mission to extend his name and his fame. And so when you're thinking about decisions that you've got to make, what you ought to be thinking through the lens of mission. Does saying yes to this opportunity, does saying yes to this decision amplify my opportunity in mission? Does it amplify opportunities that I'll have to have influence in mission, or does it diminish it? If it diminishes it, we, we cut it out. If it amplifies it, that's wise and good use of what God has called us to, and we want to extend the purposes of Jesus and the kingdom. And so the first thing we do is we consider God's word in any decision making. What we do is we first ask, is it sinful? Is what I'm thinking through sinful? If it is, we cut it out. If it's not, or if it's not clear, then we think through God's gospel and God's mission. What does the Bible say? And then we move to sort of category two, phase two, step two. The second step is this. What do the people of God say? What do the people of God say? And so as you and I are trying to make our way and sort of navigate through this life and face different decisions, different situations, what you and I need to remember and what we've got to understand is that when Jesus said to us, come follow me, When he bid us to come and to follow him, he didn't do that in isolation. Jesus has not asked us to come and to follow and to obey him as as lone rangers in isolation. Instead, when he extended the offer, come follow me, when he gave us that invitation, he brought us into a new family. He's bringing us into a new people that all now bear his name and are all now made citizens of his kingdom. And so as we first think about what the Word of God says, then it's then good and right for us to turn and to say, what is the collective wisdom of the people of God? What is the collective wisdom of God's people saying around me? And so as you consult the people around you, this ought to be uh, maybe your family members, maybe people in your family, this would be good to consult. Maybe it's your missional community, the people you're sharing life and faith with, or, or other people who are close to you. The idea here is that these would be people who you know well and that know you well and that are willing to speak honestly with you. They're willing to speak honestly with you. And these ought to be people who have an obvious relationship with Jesus. These ought to be people who prize Christ. This isn't to say that your non-Christian friends can't give you good advice, they can't give you good counsel, but it is to say that when you're consulting the people around you on a decision you're making, it's wise to think through What are the people who prize Jesus above everything? What are they thinking? What are they having to say about this particular decision? And so the reason we want to do this is because it's true that you and I, we've got blind spots. There are things about ourselves that we can't see. There are details about the decisions that we're making that maybe we're overlooking or potential pitfalls that we're not noticing. Right? And so you want people speaking into your life, even people who'd be willing to disagree with you. And that doesn't mean you write them off because they're not saying what you want them to say. It means, oh, I need to consider that. So there's a couple of Proverbs I want to point us to to show you what I'm talking about in bringing in the people of God. Proverbs 12, verse 15, it says this. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. Proverbs 18, 1 and 2 speak almost the same idea. Whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. He leaves behind all sound judgment. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. And so there's a way that's going to seem right to us, a way that in and of ourselves seems not so bad, it seems to pick a pretty good path, why not just walk down this road? But in the end, it may just be destructive. I think an area that all of us can understand what's going on here, and we've probably noticed and seen play out in our lives, we're typically a younger crowd here, so there's some single people, 
you understand this in terms of dating relationships. Think about maybe in your own life or people around you, you know a friend, right? Where you, they've gone into a relationship with somebody. They've, got, they've started a relationship with somebody, they've gone forward and everyone around is discouraging the thing. Everyone around is warning against it. You shouldn't be with this person. Uh, it's not gonna be good. It's gonna end badly. You have no business being with them. But here's what ends up happening. They say, you don't know. And they bust Akon, don't matter. Nobody wanna see us together. But I'm gonna fight my girl, right? They go down the road and they boast that anthem. They isolate themselves and it's so romantic. It's on social media. They Instagram everything. But then, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly, the whole thing turns out just the way you warned. And they end up left, they end up broken, they end up confused, and they end up crawling back to the friends who warned, right? We've seen this play out time and time again. And so there's a way that seems right to us. You don't understand, he's a good guy. No, he's not, and the people of God know, right? The people of God can see this together. You need the people of God. But let me also say this. As a leader and pastor at this church, I mean, I can speak on behalf of the rest that it's our pleasure and it's our privilege to be available for you. We, we consider it no greater honor than, than, than to be available and to process these things with you. Please reach out to us. When you're processing, you've got other people you're seeking, but also make use of us. Uh, we, we would love to be in the process with you. And I, and I can even tell you, I guarantee that there is someone in our church, either on leadership or someone that we know, that has pretty well gone through everything that you're considering. There is someone in our church that has walked down the road that you're walking down, and they've walked a little bit farther than you. And there is someone in our church that we could point you to if you'd reach out to us. And they could probably tell you about bad decisions they made, but also the way Jesus was faithful to good decisions. And they can even tell you the way that Jesus was faithful in the midst of bad decisions. And so make sure to reach out to us. We love you, we love serving you. Please let us process with you. And so we need each other. We need the collective wisdom of the people of God. The scriptures say that Christ has poured his spirit out on us in such a way, 1 Corinthians says that we have the mind of Christ. And we have that together. And so first we consider what does the Bible say? And then second we consider what do the people of God say? And then we get to step three, we get to category three, and this is always the most shocking and relieving category that we have sort of in this framework. And especially for those of you who are trying to do everything right. And here's what it is. What do you want most? What do you want most? Now I say that this is the most shocking uh, of, of all the things, especially for those who are trying to make a decision in faith if you're struggling to make a decision in faith, it, it almost sounds inconceivable to you that God would ever turn to you and let you do whatever you wanted to do. That almost sounds unspiritual to you. That, that almost sounds inconceivable. And so here's what ends up happening. We, we begin to develop this view of God, like he's this boss in the sky, and, and he's got this beard like ZZ Top, you know? And he's sort of looking down on us and, he, and he's ready to strike us. He's ready to discipline us for every wrong decision or for every wrong move. And so when it comes to making decisions, we'll have this agony in our stomachs. And, and we'll start looking for the will of God like it's, like it's solving some sort of riddle. We'll start trying to discover the will of God like it's finding an Oompa Loompa at Blues on the Green, right? They're not out there, that's just weird. But this is what we'll start doing. And so what ends up happening is that we'll get paralyzed. We'll get paralyzed in making a decision because we'll always assume there's at least one option that's godlier than the rest. We'll assume that of the options I have available, there's one option that God will be pleased with more than the others. And so here's what we'll end up doing. We've all done this, I know I have. We'll start looking for a sign. We'll start looking for a sign from God because somewhere down the way, we've heard someone say to us, God told me to do this. And we hear that statement, we go, man, I want, I want God to tell me to do something. I, I wanna hear God tell me what to do in this situation. 
And so we'll start analyzing very intently every interaction we have and all the things that people are saying to us. We'll start analyzing every intuition that we get, every gust of wind that blows by, every stomach ache. Maybe God is leading me here. Maybe this is happening. Let me just say this. There are times, no doubt, in Scripture, in our lives personally, where we can see that God makes it very clear what we want, what he wants us to do. There are times where that absolutely happens. What we want is for that to always be the case. We want that to always be the case so we can have some sort of out. If things go badly, well, God said this, right? Or we just, so we can have security knowing, well, this is probably going to go better for me. I'm going to be alleviated from pain because God said this. But let me tell you this. Though that happens, this is not the normal way that God leads his people. This, this is just not the normal way. So this is what the book of Proverbs is all about. If you read through the book of Proverbs, you're not going to find here a lot of stuff that's just supernatural wisdom. You're going to find a lot of stuff that is very common to our experiences. We're finding it's common because God's already decreed it that way, and he's giving us ordinary means for wisdom, very ordinary things. Now again, there are times where he supersedes this, but we shouldn't wait around for this. We shouldn't wait around for that God moment. Listen, listen, If God wants to make it clear what he wants you to do, then it will be clear that that's what's happening. It'll be very clear that's what's happening. But when it's not so clear, you understand that there's wisdom in place. And so I remember the first time that I was, I was trying to make this decision uh, as a believer, a big life decision. It was, where am I going to go to college? What am I going to do, right? Where am I going to go to college? And I, I wanted that God moment so bad, and I never got it. Like, it never happened for me. And I, I was so bummed by that because in my mind, there was for God sort of one college for me that ruled them all, right? He was the Lord of the college for me. And, and so I remember just agonizing over this. I wanted, I had, I had worry in my stomach. I, 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 honestly, I, I quit eating and I, I couldn't sleep. It was, it was really awful. And I, I thought to myself, if I just had more faith, then finally God will answer my prayers. My problem is not enough faith. And then the whole, it went on and on. It was, really, it was really terrible. And one day I brought this up to a guy who was mentoring me at the time in the faith. He was, he was just kind of discipling me. And I was telling him about my frustration. I was telling him about my confusion. And he stopped me right in the middle of it all. And he said, wait, 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 wait. Chad, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? He said, listen, remember God is your father. He, he's your father. And he's a good father. He's not a riddler in the sky or a bad father that's withholding food and withholding sleep from his kids. He's a good father. And you obviously want to glorify him. You obviously want to honor him in the decision you're making. And so what do you want to do? What do you want most? I mean, when he said that to me, it was like things clicked. There was so much relief that came over me, and I've understood this more now that I'm a dad. Because a good dad doesn't withhold from his children the desires he has for them and just leaves them to guess what they are. That's not what a good dad does. And also, a good dad doesn't want his children walking around on eggshells fearing they're going to make the wrong decision. That's not what a good dad does. And so as I'm playing with my girls in the yard, as I'm playing with my girls in their bedroom or wherever else we're playing, there is so much delight in me as their dad. And there is so much delight in them as my girls to live and to play and to have freedom underneath my care, underneath my protection, underneath my presence. They're they're not fearing, okay, which toy do I choose? There's a right decision and a wrong decision, and God... Uh, Dad, sorry, I'm not God. I'm, I messed that one up, but I really messed that one up. That's, I'm not God, I promise. Um, <laughs> there's a, Dad's going to be happier with a certain toy over another. They don't fear that, and I don't want them to fear that. As their father, I love watching my girls work out and try to explore the kind of values and convictions that I've built into them. How, how are they going to work those out? I have delight in them as my daughters. And the same is true with God. Listen, he delights in you. He delights in you as his child. 
And he loves watching you work out the things that he's built into you by his spirit. And so very often when you're placed between two decisions, and it's not clear which way you should go, very often it's as though God is turning to you as a father. He says, what do you want to do? How do you want to make much of me? How, what do you want, how, how do you want to glorify me here? What do you want to do? Neither way is wrong. You're free to live and you're free to play under his care, under his protection, under his presence. He's got his eye on you and he's counseling you. But notice where we are in the process. We're three steps in, which means you don't just skip to what you want to do, right? You don't just skip to this place. You, what, what does God's word say? What are God's people saying? And then we're here, right? And so as you, as you kind of work through the process, you're submitting yourself to the fear of the Lord. You're submitting yourself to the person of wisdom. You're submitting yourself to the authority of God's word and the good of his people. And so then you reach the place, what, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? And then that takes us to the fourth and final step. Trust God. Trust God. We make decisions and then we trust God. So look back at Proverbs chapter 16 in our verse in verse 9. We're going to get to the second half of the verse here. The first three steps of the process deal with that first half of the verse. And it says this, in the, the heart of man plans his way. This is the first three steps. The heart of man plans his way. Final step, trust God. Why? Because the Lord establishes your steps. The Lord establishes your steps. In the same chapter of Proverbs 16, verse 1, has almost the same reading. It says this, The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue, or the reply of the tongue, the final word, is from the Lord. And so the Lord establishes your steps. God has the final say. God has the final say. And so what we see at the end of the matter is that while we, in our hearts, plan our way, we make decisions, we take responsibility for the decisions we've made, and then we trust God. Why? Because we see in the scriptures that wherever we find ourselves in life lies in the hands of God. It lies in the hands of God. And so we're able to rest in his sovereignty over every decision we make. He's got sovereign rule over every decision. The scriptures tell us that he is moving the universe forward according to his plans so that he is in complete control of every wise and unwise decision that we make. He's got complete control of all our decisions. And so in his sovereignty, we rest and we're able to trust. Why? Because we see that our lives aren't random. Our lives aren't random. They're not an accident. God is not in heaven surprised about where you are, what you're going through. He's never caught off guard in the slightest. I mean, can you rest in that tonight? God is never caught off guard by where you are. He's never surprised. He sees you and he knows you. And so you're able to rest and to trust knowing that Jesus has secured you. He never leaves you. He never forsakes you. And Romans chapter 8 tells us he's working everything in our lives, every decision, every situation. He's working it all together for good. Now this doesn't mean that everything immediately turns out good or comfortable. But that even in our suffering, even when when it turns out not the way we wanted to, we can see in scripture that God's even using that to work together for our good in time. And so the old English preacher, Charles Spurgeon, he's got one more quote I wanna use, humor me. But it says this, God is too good to be unkind. He is too wise to be confused. If I can't trace his hand, I can always trust his heart. I love this quote because what it's saying is when I can't trace God's hand, when I can't sense what he's up to, I can always trust his heart. So hear me. God is for you. He's really for you. You can always trust his heart, what he's doing, what he's bringing about in your life. So 
So let's end just by considering Jesus tonight. Our perfect Savior, completely sinless, lived a perfect life. He never made a wrong decision. He was perfect in wisdom. The scriptures even tell us, we've talked about it already, he was wisdom himself. And yet, in perfect obedience, he suffered on a cross. And so listen, you could make every right decision and still suffer. Look at Jesus. Wisdom in decision making doesn't exempt you from suffering. We want it to. God told me. We think that God's a lucky rabbit's foot. No, 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 no. No servant is greater than his master. We see in Jesus every wise decision of obedience still led him to suffering. So not only does God have complete control of our decisions, he has complete control of the results of those decisions. Perfect obedience still brought suffering into the life of Jesus. And so check this out though. It was the wisdom of God to take his perfectly wise son and to hang him on a fool's cross to save him, to, to save fools like you and me. We don't think that was foolishness, do we? We think that was perfect wisdom. Uh, First Corinthians says this, the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it's the power of God. God's perfectly wise, even in his son. We can trust him when everything he brings about in our lives and in all of our decisions. And so it's true, right? We wanna ask the what if question. And so it's true, we want sometimes an alternate history. But what we see in Jesus is something way better than that. What we see in Jesus isn't an alternate history, it's a redeemed history. And it's a spirit-filled presence, and we receive an alternate future, a future that we would never and could never deserve, but a future that was secured for us through broken body, shed blood, and an empty tomb, right? And so as Christians, we're given now a freedom and a wisdom to make decisions. We're given help to make decisions because we have a perfectly wise word we can believe. What does the Bible say? We're given help to make decisions because we're given a family of redeemed sinners who have now the mind of Christ. What do the people of God say? We're also given new desires by the Holy Spirit who lives in us, desires for the glory of God and the kingdom of God. What, what do you want most? But not only that, we're given the help of a perfectly sovereign and wise king that we can trust. When you can't trace his hand, you can always trust his heart. In a man's heart, he plans his way. But the Lord, the Lord directs his steps. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. <laughs> thank you that it's you that directs our steps, God. Thank you that it's you and no one else. No one has your character. No one sits on a throne like you. Thank you that it's you who orders our steps and it's you who has the final say over our lives, God, over every decision we make. And Father, your reign and your rule has ordered the steps of many in this room tonight to enter in this room with faith in Jesus and salvation in him. Father, thank you for my brothers and sisters, even for me, that you've ordered my steps to this point in my life to have faith. That's a miracle from you, God. Thank you that you've ordered my steps that way. Father, there's others in the room tonight that they don't come in here Christians, they don't come in here believing Jesus, they haven't submitted themselves to the kingdom, but yet you've ordered their steps to be in this room tonight to hear your word, to hear of your sovereignty, to hear of your goodness, to hear of your son who was slaughtered for our sins. 
And Father, I pray that wherever we find ourselves either ordered in steps to faith or ordered in steps into this room outside of faith, would you give all of us a vision of your son, Jesus? Would you help us to see him as alone the person of wisdom? Would you help us to see him alone as the one who has made every right decision on our behalf that we might become righteousness, that we might become holiness in your sight? Jesus, thank you that we don't have to look back for an alternate history or ask what if, but that we can look to you and look forward to what will be when we one day see your face. King Jesus, would you help us in the here and now breathe every breath we're given and make every decision that comes in our way in a way that is according to your wisdom, in a way that would point back to you saying, to you be glory and honor and power and wealth and majesty and might forever and ever. Amen.